What does pigeon shooting, pianos, whist, and Vivaldi have in common? Well, naturally, another episode of Bridgerton. Cheerio, everyone. This is Dee, movie man, fellow cinephile, popcorn addict, and emerging film critic, coming to you with reliable recaps, reviews, and reactions. And today, I'm coming to you all with another episode of Bridgerton, Season 1, Episode 7, Oceans Apart. This episode was directed by Ulrich Reiler. He's most known for his work on the series Spooks, Hustle, The Walking Dead, Person of Interest, Tyrant, and Once Upon a Time, one of my favorite shows. He was also the first black man to receive a BAFTA award in the history of the Assembly for his work on the UK TV series The Cops. And now, let us commence. So as you may recall, things took quite a dark turn in the last episode. And that situation has created quite the disconnect with the new Duke and Duchess, to say the least. We open up with a scene where Daphne is pounding away at the piano while the Duke is doing some pigeon shooting. She's pounding away even harder. He's shooting more frequently. And then all of a sudden they both stop and just stare each other down. Yeah, I think it's safe to say that matters haven't improved quite yet. And dinner doesn't go any better as Daphne makes it clear that she'll be moving into her own rooms as is customary for a duchess after the honeymoon is over. And the honeymoon is most definitely over. Well, the Duke doesn't really care about that. He's just curious as to the success of her conjugal endeavors, which I feel is a very polite way of saying assault, but I'll let it go. However, that conversation is interrupted when Lady Whistledown's latest circular arrives and Daphne quickly realizes that Colin is embroiled in scandal. We hit our title credit, and then we see that Marina's recent deception is making waves all over town. And then the funny thing about scandals is that it doesn't just affect the person who's in the midst of it, but it also affects the people who are close to them as well. Case in point, Eloise. But for her, we already know it's not an issue. She's like, oh, well, hey, we can delay my coming out for a few years. Well, we already know the Viscountess isn't having that. She's like, uh, no, but you can keep your head up and keep smiling. We then see Lady Featherington attempting to drop off Marina at a charity house for unwed mothers. However, in this case, charity equals funds, and we know the Featheringtons are very low on that right now. Over at the Bridgerton estate, Colin, Benedict, Anthony, and the Viscountess are discussing the recent fallout. And surprisingly, Colin is sympathetic to Marina. He feels like it's all a lie and that he really has to go and talk to her. But Anthony is like, no, 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 no. As long as you stay away, people will probably believe that she tricked you. But if you go anywhere near her, then people will believe that that's actually your child she's carrying, which will in turn put our reputations on the line. Daphne arrives and the Viscountess is relieved because once everyone realizes that the Bridgerton family still have the favor of the Duke and Duchess of Hastings, then it'll be business as usual. And Daphne says yes. Pretending that nothing is wrong is an easy way to lure the ignorant into submission. Isn't that right, Mama? And the Viscountess is like, uh, uh, <laughs> she's very confused. But there's no time to get into that right now. The Queen will be hosting a luncheon, and the plan is that when Daphne and the Duke arrive, their return to London will generate so much buzz, everyone will forget about old Marina and Colin. Colin is clearly frustrated and he storms out of the room. And Daphne goes and talks to him and she can see from his reaction that he really was in love with her. He really was intending to marry her. And Daphne tells Colin he should be thankful that he figured this out now rather than marrying her and realizing you married a stranger after the fact, which is a not so subtle reference to her own marriage. Colin picks up on her behavior and he's wondering like, okay, is something wrong with the two of you? But Daphne brushes it aside. If you really do want to meet up with Marina, then I'll arrange a rendezvous with a chaperone. Later, the Duke catches Daphne peering out of her door as he walks in from a boxing session with Will. She lets him know about the Queen's luncheon and that they'll need to attend with Colin to show their support. He's like, okay, fine. And he turns to go to his room and Daphne's just like, okay, wait, 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 wait. Is this really what our marriage is going to be for the foreseeable future? I don't even know what you've been out there doing and who you've been doing it with. And the Duke is like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Do you really think that's where my head is at after three weeks of marriage? And Daphne's like, well, is it really so off the mark? I mean, we both know your reputation. And he walks up to her very closely and he's like, is that really what you believe? And we already know all it takes is for those eyes to lock. And pretty soon they're doing what they do best. And this time on the stairs. Well, one thing that you cannot call Daphne and the Duke is predictable. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, they clearly don't mind switching things up all the time. The Duke gives Daphne a very specific form of stimulation. And after that, you know, Daphne's like, okay, let's take this to the bedroom. And the Duke is like, uh, after what happened last time, that's going to be a no for me. 
And once again, Daphne is like, okay, what's going to become of us? Like, we can't go on like this. And the Duke breaks it down for her very plain and simple. If you're with child, then I'll do my duty and I'll support you both. However, if you are not with child, then we shall remain married in name only. He says our lives will be entirely separate. I was like, oh, 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 ouch, ouch. Yeah, the Duke isn't playing any games here. So later we see Daphne chaperoning Colin and Marina's visit. And Marina is very honest. She's like, no, it's not a lie. I am with child. And Colin is pretty upset about it because he figured, you know, she loved him or at the very least cared about him. And so the fact that she would commit this grave of a sin against him is just unbelievable. And Marina's just like, okay, no, 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 no. I'm gonna need you to bring that down, okay? I didn't come here to be shamed by you or anyone else. I did what I thought was best for me and my child. I had no help, no guidance in no direction. But unfortunately, Colin can't bring himself to be sympathetic. He's about to leave out, but before he goes, he lets Marina know this. You know, the worst part about all this is that I was so in love with you that had you just told me what your situation was, I would have married you anyway. Which at this point is like a knife to the chest. I'm like, oh, Marina, man, you played this all wrong. You didn't know what kind of man you had. It's a wrap on that. We then jump over to the Queen's luncheon. The Bridgerton family arrives and the Viscountess remarks on how nice it is that all of them are out together in public again. Colin's like, yes, we should tempt scandal more often. <laughs> the Queen quickly makes a beeline to the Duke and Duchess of Hastings and she minces no words. She wants to know, are you with child? That really caught me off guard, but it's not like you can refuse the Queen. The Duke says that they have certainly been devoting their energies to that task and that the Queen should soon be satisfied. Daphne mentions how easy duplicity seems to be for the Duke. And he's like, well, I learned from the best. Ooh, ouch. <laughs> they are really taking some serious jabs at each other this episode. Benedict runs into Mr. Granville and his wife, but you can tell he's really not comfortable having a conversation. So he makes up an excuse. Oh, oh I see my family. Bye. And he leaves. Eloise is told the queen wants an audience with her. And once again, she wants to know what's up with Lady Whistledown. Eloise has been asking around, but she hasn't come up with anything yet. And we already know the queen doesn't do well with patience. So she commands that Eloise give her an answer very, very soon. And then Lady Danbury, my favorite of course, makes her way over to the Duke and Duchess of Hastings. She lets both of them know that their plan to divert attention away from Colin is working. And she also invites Daphne to a party where only married ladies will be present. And then... Of all the people to show up to this luncheon, we see Lady Featherington, Philippa, Prudence, and Penelope. This really is not the smartest move because it is clear from the expressions on everyone's faces, including the queen, that they are not welcome. Eloise takes Penelope aside and they're discussing the recent scandal and how it's affected Penelope and her sisters. They haven't had a caller in three days, so it's not really going well. And despite Eloise's obsession with Lady Whistledown, she of course is not pleased that this most recent expose has damaged her friend's reputation. But then she figures, hey, maybe there's some way we can find Lady Whistledown or get in contact with her and we can get her to print a retraction and then we can restore your family's reputation. We also see Lady Featherington attempting to broach conversation with the Viscountess by, of course, throwing Marina under the bus and insinuating that she knew nothing about it. But the Viscountess does not have words for her. She turns and walks in another direction. And worse, the Queen's right-hand man goes to Lady Featherington and lets her know, your invitation has been rescinded and we're going to need you all to leave ASAP. Not really a fun way to leave a party, I must say. <laughs> Daphne is actually sympathetic and she takes some time and walks into a garden nearby and the Viscountess pops up and she can tell that something is wrong with her daughter and so she asks her and then Daphne basically lets her have it. Instead of preparing me to actually be wed, you just threw out a bunch of vague, pointless metaphors that taught me nothing about the realities of married life. And maybe if I had known something, then maybe, but then she stops because she sees that Lady Danbury is there. And it's clear that what she was going to say was that had you taught me what I needed to know, then maybe this whole situation with the Duke would not have happened, or at least they would have been able to talk about it, figure it out. But now it has blown up into this big mess and Daphne can't help but be angry at her mother. Like we could have avoided at this, now look what's happened. Later at the Featherington home, Lady Featherington is once again berating Lord Featherington for his gambling debts because she realizes were it not for that, we could have sent Marina home a long time ago, but now she's stuck here and now all of this. But then she's told she has a visitor, the Duchess of Hastings of all people. And she's there to speak to Marina alone. Marina attempts to apologize to her, but Daphne's like, no, I came here to apologize to you. I totally misjudged you and I understand why you felt the need to do what you did. 
Marina tells her about the backstory with George and the pregnancy. And then all of a sudden, Daphne has an idea. I might know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody. <laughs> and maybe we can get in contact with George and tell him about the pregnancy and see if we can get him to come back. After all, this is his child. He needs to accept the responsibility for it. Marina's pretty surprised. She's like, are you sure you can really do this? And Daphne's like, I mean, I'm capable of a lot more than you think. We then see Lord Featherington meeting up with Will of all people, but he is not there to invest in Will's next match. He's actually there because he has a proposition. Throw the match and I will make a wager so massive that the winnings will have you and your family set for life. Will, of course, is offended because it's a matter of honor, and honor is everything to him, and not for sale. And so Lord Featherington backs off, he's about to leave, but then he lets him know, okay, let's not get it twisted here. I mean, people pay money because you are an entertainer, you are a performer, that's what they're there for. No gentleman will ever see you as a respectable man of business. I mean, I know all about your father. He was a soldier who fled the colonies after serving in a regiment. Do you think he went through all that just for his son to become some exhausted fighter struggling to put food on the table for his family? Wait, 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 wait. Will isn't having that. He grabs Lord Featherington and throws him against the wall. And Lord Featherington's like, okay, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, fine, I get it. I'm doing this for my family also. So he leaves, but he also gives him his card and tells him to think about it. Later, we see Daphne attending Lady Danbury's Married Lady Soiree, and it is quite the event. I mean, we're not talking straight lace polite society here, but no, everyone's having a good time. We're drinking, we're gambling, like we are living it up. Lady Danbury tells Daphne that she considers this to be her den of iniquity. <laughs> Lady Danbury also introduces her to Lady Trowbridge, Lucy Granville, and Kitty Langham, who just so happens to be the wife of the general. You can tell Daphne's slightly uncomfortable at first, but they deal her in, she starts to learn about the game, and pretty soon she's kicking back and having a good time. Ironically enough, we jump over to the Gentleman's Club where everything is looking quite the opposite. Kind of dull, kind of monotonous, kind of boring. Well, that is until the ladies come through. For a moment, Anthony thinks that he sees Sienna in the lineup, but just his imagination. Running away with him. Anyway, shout out to the Temptations. We see Daphne back at the game and her beginner's luck has gone quite a long way and she has won a whole lot of money off the three ladies. The other two leave and she is left to speak with Kitty, who as I mentioned is the wife of the general. And so now Daphne is hoping that she can talk to Kitty to get in contact with the general to get in contact with George. <laughs> and Kitty lets her know, mm, you might have to ask him that yourself because we live separate lives. I get all the freedoms of marriage without having to bear the burden of his company. So Kitty is living the life apparently, and ironically, it's a life that Daphne is about to live herself. But she does let Daphne know that she'll give her the general's information so she can contact him directly. Over the gentlemen's club, the Duke and Anthony are having a conversation about the Duke's marriage to Daphne. Anthony recognizes that there is clearly some issue between the two of them, but he places the sole responsibility for that on the Duke. And of course the Duke is offended, not just by the assumption, but by the hypocrisy considering how Anthony leads his life. And then Anthony fires back by saying, it's unfortunate that your father was so absent from your life that he never taught you how to run a proper household. And I was like, eh, okay, no, 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 no. See, whenever people start bringing up significant trauma just to prove a point, no. <laughs> we done here, like, we have nothing else to discuss. Oh, ho, ho, but wait a minute, the Duke is sitting on ready. He's like, but what about your struggles? What about you fulfilling your responsibilities? What about the promises you made to your father before he died? Hmm, if the Viscount were here now, I wonder what he'd say. Ooh, well, them's fighting words. <laughs> so Anthony jumps up and he starts punching the Duke. The Duke punches him back. They are brawling. They crash into one of the tables and it's one big mess. We see Daphne stumbling in after her night out at Lady Danbury. She clearly has had quite a time. She sees that the Duke's door is open and she can also tell that he's been wounded, but the Duke doesn't mention Anthony. He just says that he had a rough boxing practice with Will. Daphne decides to let things go, at least for the moment, and she tends to his wounds. And of course, that good old chemistry is still there, but it's tough because that big old elephant is still there also. And Daphne lets her guard down and she's like, would us having a child really be so bad? And of course, the Duke can't answer her. And Daphne doesn't understand what could possibly be so horrible that he would swear to never have a child. So then the Duke finally tells Daphne about his childhood, his upbringing, his abuse, his trauma, all of that, and how he came to make that vow. And Daphne's just like, you mean to tell me 
that all of this, all of this foolishness is because of a vow you made to a man who is no longer alive. So all the potential children and happiness that we could have, you're going to just take that all away as a form of revenge against your father who's dead. And although I did understand where the Duke was coming from, especially in that second episode, now that Daphne's repeating it, it's kind of like, yeah, that really doesn't make sense. But of course, the Duke is not budging. So Daphne says, okay, well, no worries. Besides, pretty soon we'll find out how we're going to live the rest of our lives. Miserable together or happy apart. Later, Daphne tells Marina about how she wrote to the general. Well, Marina's appreciative, but then she realizes that Daphne signed it without the Duke. And unfortunately, male-centered society, without the Duke's signature, it won't be taken seriously and he might not respond to her. Later, Anthony speaks to Colin and surprise, surprise, he apologizes to him. Colin is definitely caught off guard, but then he also realizes that Anthony was just trying to protect him from making a very foolish mistake. Now for Eloise, the time has come to take her place in society. Her hair has been pulled back, her hymns have been lowered, and it's officially time for her to grow up and step forward and embrace her future. Well, easier said than done. But then the Viscountess lets her know, hey, if you really don't want to do this, then it's fine. Maybe I have been rushing you. However, Eloise knows that the Queen is going to be at tonight's concert, so she absolutely is going to be there. Jumping forward to the concert, Benedict pulls aside Mr. Granville, and he really just wants to understand what the situation is between Mr. Granville and his wife. Mr. Granville, as usual, is very straightforward. He's like, look, I'm in love with Lord Weatherby, and my marriage allows my wife certain freedoms and protections. And if we're being honest, it's a happier union than most people in this room. And I was like, well, I mean, I mean, that's probably true. And Benedict still doesn't get it. He's like, well, what about honor? What about romance? Mr. Granville is like, uh, what point are you trying to make? You don't understand my situation. You don't understand what it's like to be in the same room with someone you can't live without and just feel like you're oceans apart. He also says it takes courage to live outside the traditional expectations of society. And I'm like, oh yeah, especially back then. I mean, the further we go back, the worse it is for people. If, as soon as you stepped out of line, as soon as you breathed wrong, had the wrong expression, had the wrong clothing, it was just like, cut, you're out of here. And Mr. Granville lets Benedict know, look, I understand you talk about not being traditional, but I think that's all that it is, talk. At last, Eloise reveals her final answer to the queen as to Lady Whistledown's identity. It is, drum roll please, a tradesperson. But the queen is not impressed. She says, I am no longer in need of your services. I've hired some investigators of my own. We're going to expose Lady Whistledown and we're shutting her little gossip rag down. Unfortunately, that means Eloise is now expendable. So long, farewell. Another shout out to the design team for another great headpiece. This time we have micro braids. I'm here for all of it. So Benedict is over the concert and Eloise isn't too keen on staying herself, so they leave together. They're riding in the carriage and Benedict lets Eloise know that they'll be picking up a friend on the way. Well, lo and behold, that friend turns out to be none other than Madame Delacroix, also known as the Modiste. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. I guess I don't really know what I was expecting, but I guess it wasn't this, but surprise, surprise. All three of them are sitting in the carriage and it's extremely awkward and extremely tense. But then as Eloise is speaking to Madame Delacroix about her night out at the concert, she suddenly has a realization. What if Madame Delacroix is Lady Whistledown? Back at the concert, we hear Vivaldi's The Four Seasons being performed, which I thought was hilarious. Because for those of you who have been consistently watching these recaps and have been just kind of following me as I've explored this series, you'll know that my intro music is Vivaldi's The Four Seasons and specifically the spring composition. And it's so interesting because me adding that music was just kind of spur of the moment. I just had a thought in my mind, like what would fit the vibe of this show? And I kept hearing like the tune in my head, but I couldn't even remember the name. I just was like, dun 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 dun. And I was like, oh my gosh, what is that song? And I can't even remember what I typed in. I think I had to do classical music and then kind of go down a rabbit hole and figure it out. Once I did, I was like, this fits perfectly. So it was a cool moment to see that same music being represented in the show and in my recaps. We see Anthony inside the theater. He is scanning the crowd and just like clockwork, his eyes have located Sienna and she is there with a gentleman. 
Back at the Featherington home, we see Marina mixing together all these herbs and all these ingredients to create some kind of concoction for her to drink. And as soon as I saw that, I was like, I was hoping, I was like, no, she wouldn't do that, would she? Oh, but she would. So when Penelope goes and knocks on her door and she doesn't hear anything, she opens the door and we see Marina on the floor, passed out. Now, whether she's dead, dying, or just unconscious, we don't know, but... Oh, I'm like, Marina, this is not the solution. <sighs> I was so mad. And then over at the theater, we see that Daphne is watching the concert with the Duke. He places his hand on hers, and for a moment, it looks like all will be well again. But then suddenly, Daphne has this very visceral reaction, and she jumps up and runs out of the box. The Viscountess follows after her, and very soon, Daphne realizes that her courses have returned again. So not only is she not pregnant, this is also the beginning of the end for her and the Duke. And as Daphne begins to cry and her mother embraces her, we see the Duke sitting in the box listening to Daphne with tears in his eyes. Whew! And that closes out episode seven, Oceans Apart. I mean, we have really turned a corner here. I mean, everything was so bright and happy and romantic and funny but now we have like gone downhill things have gotten very sad and very dark and almost all of these characters are facing a very uncertain future so i'm like now like and the next episode is the finale so i'm like how is all this going to be resolved i can't imagine how i'm sure they'll find a way but i'm like oh like everybody is in some mess which is fun to watch but i'm just like who. How are we all going to get out of this one? So, once again, this is D Movie Man, signing off, and I'll see you at the movies.